recording here is Project One, Working in InDesign. Um, also, uh, you know, we also need to consider fonts on this too, so we're going to be working with some fonts. Again, InDesign should be down on the dock, but it's not today with our network issues. So if you go to the Applications folder, it's just a folder and you float over, it says Applications. Click on the InDesign folder one time, and then click on the InDesign icon one time. It will open InDesign. Now, when InDesign opens, I did get these crazy messages. There was a startup alert. It said, Adobe InDesign does not recognize assignment UI InDesign plugin. I hit, I didn't hit don't show again. You can hit that. But then another one pops up and it says it doesn't recognize the bridge plugin. Another one pops up and says in copy bridge plugin. It doesn't recognize all these plugins. So it went through one, two, three, four, five, six error messages or warning messages about plugins. You guys might have the same problem. I'm going to let IT know that this is happening. We'll see if it messes with us in being able to work in InDesign. Uh, we'll find out. Okay, so just hit either don't show me again, either one. Just just hit, hit it so it goes away, and you'll have to hit about six times. But each one of those windows is a different plugin that it's having a problem with. So I've already done that and hit those messages and wrote those down for IT. So when you're in InDesign, what we're going to do is we're going to create um, a new document. This new document can be three pages long because we're dealing with three different images, three different solutions to this problem. So we're going to go to File and New, and we're going to go to Document. Now, normally I would just hit Command N. So Command N or Control N will bring you up the new document panel in Photoshop, Illustrator, and Design. Now, this is important. You do not want facing pages on because this is not a book. So uncheck facing pages. By default, it's checked. Um, it is not a letter size document. We'll be printing to letter size paper. Actually, we could print to any size as long as it accommodates the 8 inches by 8 inches. But the document itself is going to be 8 inches by 8 inches. So even though you're printing on a specific sheet of paper, the size of this is 8 inches by 8 inches. Now you'll notice in the width it says 51p0. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means 51 pike is 0 points. On your quiz, it says type is measured with using points and pikas. Uh, that was the correct answer. Um, 50. Pike. I'm sorry. Yes. Twelve. No, six pikas is one inch. There's um, there's 12 points in one pika. Points are really tiny. They're one seventy seconth of an inch. Points are real tiny. The actual size of type is measured in points, but typographic measure is measured in points and pikas. Where we use pikas is we the how wide a column is or even how big a page is. We don't measure those in points unless it's like if it's uh, fifty one and a half pikas, it'd be fifty one pika six points. A half of a pika is six points because a full pike is 12 points. So yeah, and there's 72 points in an inch. So this is where that 1 72nd of an inch came from. So yeah, you guys almost need to commit that to memory just for testing and stuff. But yeah, there's six pikas in an inch. One pika is 1 6th of an inch. There's 12 points in one pika. In that little 1 6th of an inch, there's 12 points. And then in the whole inch, there's 72 points. Well, you guys aren't used to this. 51 P0 means 51 pikas but with zero points, okay? So just, it's an even 51 pikas, no points left over. Well, what that is, is that is eight and a half by 11 inches. How do I know that? If you divide 51 by six, you get eight and a half. Yes, exactly. Because there's six pikas in an inch. So that's where, if we take the 51 and divide it by six, because there's six pikes in an inch, it'll give you how wide this is. This is where algebra and mathematics kicks in, yes. So 66 pike is wide would be how many, or tall, would it be how many inches? 66 divided by 6 is 11. Yeah, I get you. My brain and your brain are similar. I'd be saying the same thing. It's 11. So this is an 8.5 inch by 11 inch tall document. That's not what we want. We want an 8 inch wide by 8 inch wide document. 48 pikas by 48 pikas is what Don said. Is that right? 8 times 6 is 48. 
So we want to make this 48 picas by 48 picas. Now, this is a custom size document. Yes, sir. Yes, I was about ready to cover that. If you guys are like totally pica challenged and you hate them because you lived in the United States all your life without dealing with picas. Now, I lived in the United States all my life without dealing with picas too and, and points until I went to college. Then it became a, then it was like, you got to know points and picas because that's how we measured everything. Our rulers, we didn't use inch rulers when I was in college, ever. We use points and picas. Now, we don't, we're not quite that big of a stickler here with the digital world. So what, um, what Jeffrey is saying is he says, why can't you just put 8 space bar I in? Now, you don't even have to put space bar. I just like to separate things. You know how I like gr grammar. But 8 space I in means 8 inches. And then you, if I hit the tab key, it will automatically convert 8 inches into 48 pi because we don't have to do the mathematics. Hmm. That's nice, isn't it? Now, you can set this up so it will always be inches, but right now the default for InDesign is set in picas and points. So I can share with you how to do that um, for your home computer. Now, here where it says margins, well, we need to go to the next thing, columns. Um, you have to specify at least one column. If you put zero in there, it'll give you an error. If you read the newspaper, the newspaper is, or you've seen a newspaper, how many of you guys read a newspaper anymore? couple of you, but the, the type is in columns. Well, if, there are, if they're not separated in columns, there's at least one big column. So we just leave that alone, one column. The gutter is the space between columns. Well, since there's only one column, there's no space between them. So the gutter is the space between columns. And then we have margins. Now, for this project, it's nice to have some margins. Um, it's not as important as maybe some other projects. But if it's a three pica margin, how many inches is that? Half an inch. There's six picas in an inch, so three picas would be a half an inch. Half inch margin's fine on this. You still need a little bit of safety area so you know, hey, don't put your type past this point. Now, before I open this, I will tell you, margin lines are pink or a purplish pink. They don't print. Things that go past the margin or outside the margin, it still prints. A lot of people think the pink line is the edge of the page. That's not true. That's just showing you a safety margin for you not to put your type past. Okay? Now, this next thing I'd really like to talk to you about because I need to share with you um, things that are industry standard. This thing that says bleed and slug, I want to pull that down. I can actually have the document go ahead and put a bleed line on the outside of the trim area. Now. What is a bleed? Well, if you have a document or a design, such as the one I'm holding in my hand, so you can't see this on video, but this has ink going right to the edges of the page. The image goes right to the edges on both sides of this magazine, front and back cover. This is called a full bleed, meaning it bleeds top, left, or top, outside, inside, and bottom. For things to bleed, they need one eighth of an inch extra outside the cut line. Okay? It is industry standard that bleeds are set out one eighth of an inch for this kind of document. Now, if you're working on a billboard, the bleeds may be as big as 10 inches because this is a giant thing. But on small things like magazines and books and business cards and all that, uh, one eighth of an inch. So this is going to put bleed lines on the whole document. So in the bleed, I know that the I know that an eighth of an inch is nine points, not nine picas, but nine points. But if I don't know that, but I tell you it's an eighth of an inch, you can put the decimal point equivalent in here. One eighth of an inch is 0.125. Okay. Then you hit the space bar and type in inch. I n, just I n. Now. Assuming that the link is linked, which is on the far right, I'm airing over it right now, when I hit the tab key to go to the next field, they will all change to an eighth of an inch. Now, if that link were unlinked, such as what's below on the slug, we won't use the slug, by the way, I'll tell you what one is, but we won't use it, then it would only change one margin or one area and not the rest. But you can see that one eighth of an inch is indeed nine points. 
Notice how it says zero pica, zero P9. There's no dot in there. That looks like there is because the screen's got some dirt on it, but there's no dot in there. Okay, zero pica, nine points is what, how that reads. Now I'm going to hit OK, and we're going to see this InDesign document. Now the cool thing about Creative, uh, uh, Creative Cloud is they put gray outside the, in the pasteboard area. This used to be white in previous versions. This kind of confused people as to where's the edge of the page. They thought the pink line was the edge of the page, the purple pink line. The edge of the page falls to the edge of the gray. So there's actually a black line around there. That will print, not the black line, but the edge of the page will print. So that is the actual edge of the page. It's kind of cool with Creative Cloud that it's done that. The red line is where we told it to put a bleed line. Okay? Now, we're going to have to go back to Photoshop. I did this on purpose. We're going to have to go back to Photoshop. We're going to have to open our 8 by 8 inch graphics, and we're going to have to add an eighth of an inch bleed on those, especially the black ones. The white ones, not so much. Not a big deal, because we're it'll print white anyway. But for those of you guys who have black backgrounds, we're going to have to go into Photoshop, and we're going to have to adjust the bleed. Does anybody want to know how to do that? I bet you do. So I am going to open Photoshop. And I have an 8 inch by 8 inch document up here. I have Laurel's Funky C. Now, it's only 8 inches by 8 inches. How do I know? Well, I could turn on rulers by hitting Command R, and you would see that it does indeed look to be 8 inches wide, 8 inches tall. The other thing is you can go to Image, Image Size, and it will tell you it's 8 inches by 8 inches. Okay. Now, we don't go to Image, Image Size, and sit there and type in 8 and a eighth by eight and an eighth because it'll just increase the size of the image. We want, we want the image to stay the same size, we just want the canvas that it's on to increase. So we're going to increase the canvas size. If you have black backgrounds, you have to increase your canvas size. Okay. So you would go to image and canvas size and you want that to be eight and one eighth by eight and one eighth all the way around. Actually, no, it's more than that. You have to compensate. The eighth of the top plus the eighth of the bottom. Oh, I almost forgot. We're actually adding an eighth of the top and the bottom, so it's going to be what? Eight and a quarter. You guys with me? So let's go back to InDesign for just a second so we can see what I'm talking about. So up here at the top is an eighth of an inch bleed, and down here at the bottom is an eighth of an inch. So we're adding an eighth of an inch on top and bottom. This is So eighth plus eighth equals a quarter. So I'm going to go back to Photoshop. Now, you want to make sure the anchor is on the center, which right now it is, because this means it'll give you um, the bleed from the center out. So you type in 8.25, it's already in inches, and then you do the same thing for the second one, and you hit OK. Oops, darn it, I got a white border. OK, well, shoot. You need to go to that background Make sure your foreground color that's over here in the toolbar is rich black, 30 cyan, 30 magenta, 0 yellow, 100% black. Make sure that's correct. Go back to the background, select all, just command A, and then go and fill it again with that foreground color, which is this color right here. Okay, now we're done. And now I can save it. Well, white, you don't have to worry about it because the when you have a white at the edge, it just it doesn't matter. It's not a color, so it'll just go ahead and print white anyway. There's no white ink in the printer, so we don't have to worry about white. Any other color than white, though? Yes, we'd have to pull the bleed. So, hit fill and then go to use foreground color. Hold on. Uh, yeah, use the foreground color that's 30, 30, 0, and 100 if it's black. Yes. Now, if it's white, you don't have to do anything, assuming that the background is white. You're printing on white paper. So there's no worries. Oh, black you have to worry. Yeah, black you definitely have to worry about it. Yes, black you absolutely have to worry. Anything other than white you have to worry about manufacturing or creating a bleed. Now, how many of you guys are photography students? One, two, two, only two, three-ish? Or are you taking photo classes? 
what you as photographers have to keep this in mind, and you have to work with your graphics folks and say, say I hire you to do a shoot for me, uh, which I used to hire photographers all the time to do shoots for me. And I would have to, we'd have to communicate, and I'd have to say, hey, um, there's, this is the cover image, and it's going to bleed on all the sides. So make sure you give me a little extra on the edges that is okay to get cut off. In other words, don't put really important things right to the edge of the photo because they're going to get cut off. So as photographers, you guys need to know that you may have to pad your photo, pad your composition a little bit, and have extra information out there that you know is going to get cut off. Yes? Would that be a good practice just to, like, when you're setting up the image initially? Just to, like, yeah, oh, it's good practice. So, yeah, yeah. If you're, no, I, for photographers, I have some great tips I can talk about later about how when you're working with layout, somebody gives you a layout and says, I need a photograph for this layout. They might give you a sketch or something. Uh, I can give you some tips later on how to manage that so that way your photo isn't covering something that they really didn't want you to cover. Um, yeah, I used to work with a lot of photographers and we had a good time making sure that we got everything right so we didn't have to reshoot. Okay, I'm going to save this image um, as a TIFF and I'm going to keep its layers intact because I might have to move the little uh, C, the little photo of the C in that space, but for now I'm going to leave it. Okay, so I'm back to InDesign now, and I'm going to place that image that I just worked on, and it has that bleed. Now, in InDesign, you place images. Let me tell you how not to do it. Let me show you the wrong way, okay? I just want to show you the wrong way because people do it all the time, and it's incorrect. Here is the incorrect way. Oh, I'm going to select all of this. And I'm going to copy it, and I'm going to go to InDesign, and I'm going to paste it. Well, first off, it only got the background because it wasn't a flattened image. But if the image were flat, it would have grabbed everything and put it in there. Now, that's called an embedded graphic, and it's a no-no in the industry. Even just because you can doesn't mean you should. This is one of those kind of scenarios. So I'm going to delete that. Now, what we're going to do instead is we're going to go to File and Place, which is Command-D. File and Place, <coughs> Control-D on a PC. Now, when we place an image, it still has to link up to the image. When you place an image in InDesign, don't throw that image away. Keep it in the same folder with the InDesign file because it has to link up to it. If anybody's ever done websites, you have a root folder and you need everything in that root folder. Uh, unless you're doing WordPress or something, but uh, you don't want to you want you don't want InDesign to go. Hey, you're missing your graphic. You're missing your link. The image that we created is a linked graphic, so I'm going to place it. That was file place. I go find it. For me, it's called C tip, and I hit open. And what you have when you hit open is you have what's called a loaded cursor. See the little miniature picture there. You want to be careful where you put this guy because you don't want to work too hard. If you bring it up to the upper, now for white images you could just bring it to the zero point, meaning the upper left hand corner of the actual page. But this has a bleed, so you want to bring it up to the upper left hand corner bleed line and you click and it positions that image pretty much exactly where it's supposed to go with the bleed. Okay. Now, what I would oftentimes do after I've done this is I would bring up my layers in InDesign. Let me minimize Photoshop so we don't see them, those layers too. I would go into layers and I would lock that layer. Locking that layer, you, to do that, you click right next to the eyeball icon. That's a show or hide layer. But there's a little empty box between the eyeball and the name of the layer. And you click there and you've locked the layer. This keeps you from accidentally moving this thing all the time. Then we can create a separate layer for our type. Now, if you want to name, rename the layer, just double click on it, and a layer options box will open. And I'm just going to lay, layer this um, or label it what it is pigskin, C. Sometimes I'll call it image. Now you'll notice that in this layer it has no pencil or no drawing. 
That means you can't do anything with it because it's locked. As soon as you turn that, tur take that lock off, it'll take the no symbol off of your drawing item there. Okay, so I would recommend sometimes doing that because it's really frustrating when you're clicking on stuff and it moves around and you have to put it back where it's going. And you're like, oh. Yes, Tate. Um, I put my uh, tip file onto uh, the, the photo from the side and the photo signal. It's come back all fuzzy and stuff. Okay. If it's super fuzzy, mine's fuzzy too. Let me show you. I'll zoom in. It's just the lights are um, kind of screwy in this room. Pixelated. Now, you're that kind of scares you because you're going, oh, if I print this, it's going to look like that. And you don't want it to look like this. And you know the photo looked good. Now, what this is doing is InDesign is giving you a display so that uh, it's displaying images so it'll work faster. Now, it's no big deal. If you had 100 images, we might want it to display like this. But if you just only have one image and you want it to look sharp, you can right-click on that image with the um, selection tool. Get your black arrow. Um, un make sure your uh, oh, layer is unlocked for this. I've locked my layer. But right click on that image and go to display performance. And right now it's on typical display. Right click up here. Right click display performance. If you put it on a high quality display, it will look a lot better. It won't look so pixelated. Okay. Wow, that's lovely. So again, that was right click on it with the uh, selection tool. Go to display performance and make it, I don't think I have the right thing clicked on. Hold on, I have to zoom out. Right click, display performance and make it high quality. Okay, so it'll give you a much better look than what you had before. Now that freaks a lot of people out because they're like, man, this is gonna print like this and I'm not gonna be very happy because I know the photo looked better than this. Even with the display performance set at a lower resolution, it will print fine. <laughs> It will print just fine, but it does kind of kind of bother you because you're like, hey, that doesn't look like uh, what the photo is supposed to look like. Good observation, Mr. Tate. Make sure I got it on high. There we go. Okay. Now, um, again, make sure your layer is locked. Now we're ready to create a second layer that we're going to put type on. Um, to create a new layer, it's just like Photoshop. You just click on the new layer button, which is the little uh, dog-eared page at the bottom of that panel. So it's right next to the little trash can. Right there it is. Double click on that layer and just call it typography. Now in Photoshop, when you work in type, it automatically names the layer, uh, whatever the type is that you type in there. It doesn't do that in InDesign. All right. Now, um, what we're ready to do is we're ready to uh, bring in some type. What was what were we doing here? This was uh, what was the word? Cut or cover? Cut or cover. I'm just going to use cut. That's pretty plain and simple. Now you got to make sure you're on the correct layer. If I have the pigskin layer selected and the lock icon is showing, and I grab my type tool, I'll bring it over here. And nothing happens, and it keeps giving me an arrow that I don't read, and I keep hitting OK and and, and it's just like, well, what do I do now? Well, I just unlock that layer. Read your, guys, read your stuff. Because um, you'll start doing really crazy things like I drew this box and didn't even know it. So I need to lock that layer. When you click on your type tool, make sure you're on the right or the correct layer. And if you just click and start typing, nothing happens. Okay. Photoshop, if you just click with the type tool and start typing, it types the word. However, in InDesign, you have to click and drag a type box, a text box, and then you can start typing the word. And you're like, but I can't see the word. Well, no, you can't. Because if you have a black background, InDesign automatically makes type black. So we have to make this type white or some other color. So this type is in here really small. Now to make it big we hold down shift command and greater than after we highlight it. Remember that? That was for Monday. Shift command greater than. Now you can barely tell there's a UT in there on my monitor but you can't see it on the screen above. But I need to make this white. 
To make it white, we would you typically use swatches. There's a color palette out, palette out there, but we don't use the color palette very often. Um, we can control color a lot better through swatches. So if we just wanted to make that white, we would choose paper. We're printing on white paper, therefore this will end up being white. Okay? Now you can make it other colors as well. Uh, right now you only have a limited color palette. If you want to see all the colors that we use in printing, uh, you can go to the flyout menu in the color panel, which is the tiny little little arrow with four slashes in the upper right hand corner. And you can go to new color swatch. And we as professionals use Pantone. And we would use typically either a coated or uncoated paper. But we would want Pantone, CMYK, coated or uncoated. We're probably printing on uncoated paper. But Pantone, CMYK, uncoated. And it'll bring up the Pantone colors that we use in the industry. So you can go through there and choose a color. Now I probably wouldn't choose red because red on black are, is just too hard to read, but I'm going to choose red for now anyway. I'm going to hit add and it will add it to the color pa panel, uh, the swatches panel rather, and when I'm done I hit done. And you'll notice that because this is a select and effect environment, because I had this selected it did affect it and it affected the box that the type is in, it did not color the type. Oops. Now, how do we change that or remedy that? Up here in the swatches panel, this is very, very tiny. Right now, the, the formatting affects the container that the type is in. Remember how to draw the box first and then type the type. Well, that's called the container. I want that to be filled with none. If you want the type to be colored a certain color, the, if you click on the little T right here, the formatting will then affect the text. So if you want it to be yellow or purple or gray or green or red or whatever, you can click on whichever color. A lot of people have a hard time with that because they don't really pay attention to these little tiny items. So probably keep your formatting for the container um, of fill out with none, and then you can play with uh, the type by clicking on the T, which in the swatches panel. Okay. Now, we are limited to how many fonts we can use here because we don't have very many of them loaded. So you want to definitely look at our fonts folder or fonts uh, folder on the Viscom drive and really get something that resonates well. To me, this does not necessarily resonate as well as maybe something else. But it's just what I threw in here. This is a, this is just because don't let the computer make choices for you cuz I should not see uh, Times New Roman or, you know, uh, certain fonts that are just default fonts that are, the, the, oh, the computer chose that for me. Guys, don't let the computer make choices, choices for you. They, the computer makes the wrong choice almost 90% of the time. So please don't use Times New Roman because it was the default and you were just too uh, much in a hurry to go find you a decent typeface. Now, did you guys notice that I could increase and decrease this really quickly like so? Did you guys see that? Do you want to know how to do that? Of course. That is really, like, that's, that's gravy right there. Um, now, the one thing I showed you before was highlighting the type and holding a shift command and going lesser than or greater than. Well, you want to be here all day, we can do that. But you guys want to just design by eye, you want to design intuitively, and you want to go quickly. So in InDesign, when you have a type box, a container of type, and you want to increase that type quickly, now, we're not highlighting the type. That's, that's not what we're doing. We're actually using the selection tool to select the container. We hold down Shift and Command. On a PC, that would be Shift and Control. On a Mac, it's Shift and Command. And when you click and drag, it will drag that as large or as small as you want. Now, if you click and you wait to drag, it will show you live, meaning you can see the U and T as they're getting larger. If you click and drag and don't hold it down and wait to drag, you don't see the UNT get bigger. Okay, it'll get bigger when you let off. Again, shift command on a PCB control, but on our Mac, shift command, click, hold, wait a second, and then drag. Okay, and that keeps it in proportion, it doesn't stretch the type. 
Yes, as soon as I click off, or well, here's here's how you get rid of it. Um, in the that's called the bounding box, by the way. Yes, it will go away. It doesn't print. Um, and how to see if it will print or not? There is a preview button <coughs> in your type tool. Your type tools over here on the left. I would recommend hitting the double arrow so your type. Um, oops, I got rid of all together. If you lose your tools, click on uh, Window Tools and oh, there they are. Um, click on the little double arrow and it'll go in two columns. Now, the reason why I want you to do that is then you can get this preview button. And when you click the preview button, which is in the far bottom lower right corner of the tool panel, it will give you exactly what it's going to look like when it prints. So if you don't see lines around stuff, then they aren't there. Okay? Yeah, it's this little guy right here. I'm having a problem with it going for some reason. There's preview, there's bleed, there's slug, which the slug, by the way, is, uh, and then there's presentation. Presentation is, uh, Adobe um, InDesign does, uh, we can do um, PDF presentations through Adobe InDesign, so that's what the presentation thing's about. And if you hit escape, it'll get back out of there. <clears throat> now, the normal working mode, which shows you bounding boxes and the bleed line and the margin, it's the lower left hand box. So now, I usually just hit W. Now, if you're in a type box and you hit W, it's going to type a W. But if you go W, you can toggle between um, print preview and the working preview or working normally. So W. But if you're in a type box, it'll type a W. So you have to be out of a type box. I think of W as what you see is what you get. So W for what you see is what you get. This would be what it looks like when it prints. This is what it looks like when, it, when you're working. Okay. Now, you guys remember how to load fonts and find them? Yeah, I, I, I like to look for fonts that resonate well with my message. So you want to make sure that you get onto the uh, Viscom drive. Now, I'm already on the Viscom drive, so I can go on to uh, click, double click on your Macintosh hard drive if you're already on Viscom. And where it says I-N-S-T-E-C-H, you can click there, and the fonts will be there. Now, if you are at home and you are in Blackboard, I think in the resources section at the very bottom of the resources, I have all the fonts there. Yep. So if you're not here or if you're here and the network's down like it is today for some of us, if, you're in, if you go to Blackboard and you click on Resources, the Resources tab over here, you scroll all the way to the bottom, or the bottom most item. It says Fonts for Educational Use Only. It talks about how to load the font if you're on a Mac, how to load the font on the PC. This is assuming you don't have uh, suitcases, suitcase fusion. But you click on that underlined fonts for educational use only and it has a folder that's or an item that says fonts organized by name that's all of the fonts that are on the viscom they're in a zip file so you can download them um, at home unzip them and investigate them and there's a video about how to load fonts um, it's probably geared more towards suitcase fusion and how we do it in class but uh, there is a video there. So if you can't get to the Viscom drive today, we have it on Blackboard. And the folder is called Fonts General 2012. The fonts for PCs is something we had to give to the IT guys so that we could have them lo preload some fonts on the PCs because we can't, we can't load fonts on the PCs. We can only load them on the Macs. The PCs have a thing where they're all locked out. Hmm. Now, in order to view the fonts, because it's a bit of a daunting task with all these typefaces, I would close display fonts because that is, uh, you know, this, we're doing sans serif or serif. Actually, did, did that really say? It didn't really say for the rest of the type. You could do anything, I guess. But if you wanted to view the fonts, <coughs> up in the top of the Mac uh, Finder, there is, uh, right now I have it view by list, but there's a uh, show items as icons. And assuming these folders are open, as they are 
here, you can just arrow down using the arrow key on the keyboard. And you can go, eh, yeah, that'd be cool. Or no, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, 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 yeah. Now these are not loaded, These we're just looking at them to see if we want to load them. Okay, so you can look at these fonts and say, oh man, that one looks kind of cool, I'm going to use that. It's called Flood. Maybe I use that one for cut, I don't know. So I'm going to steal that one, I'm not stealing it, I'm taking it, I'm dragging it to my desktop. It stays there in the VizCom. Okay, and I can load this. Now you can load it by double clicking and hitting install, that's how you would do it at home. But you guys want to know how they do it in the professional world? Yep. It's called Suitcase Fusion. Now on your dock, which is at the bottom of your monitor, down at the very bottom, there's a thing that says SF and it has a, it's, it's got blue background and a, a bold a white S and an italic F with a little bit of a floral sort of pattern in there, nuclear symbol or something. You click on Suitcase Fusion. Now this is the proper way. When you guys go out and get jobs, they, get, uh, they have font managing software. They don't just double click on a font and tell it to load. We actually go through professional software and load them. So this is our Suitcase Fusion software. Now on the job, all the fonts would already be loaded here and you would just activate them as you need them. But we're different because of servers or whatever. Um, yes? A web, a connect to web ink um, window that comes up. And I will be suitcase fusion. It's no thanks. Suitcase fusion enables you to high quality fonts on your websites through the web ink web service. These high quality fonts are provided by the Earthworld font foundries and are well suited for web services. You can web ink fonts on your site in a relatively simple process. To get started, preview your font, just create a font. Oh, just hit no thanks. Yeah, if you get a web ink thing, say no thanks because you don't need to create an account. I didn't get that. But if you do, say no thanks. All right, so I have Suitcase Fusion open. Let me move this font so I can see it up there. And what you do to load fonts through Suitcase Fusion is just drag and drop. So I drag this font down to the uh, window at the bottom to the right. It's got a light striping through it. You can't probably see the striping on the overhead, but there's a light amount of striping in there. Now, that font is loaded through suitcases, but it's not activated. So, loaded and activated are two different things. And that's an all caps font. Now, if I wanted to use upper and lower case, I'd have to choose a different font. By the way, this sentence, the quick brown fox jumps over a lazy dog. Why do they use that sentence to show you what this font looks like? It shows all letters of the alphabet. All letters of the alphabet are in there. Yep. Correct. There's a few statements out there that they use for that. So you get to see every single letter of that particular typeface. To turn this typeface on so that Adobe can use it, to the left of the star and the name of the font, if you float your cursor under the little ball, see just to the left of the star, if you float your cursor there, a little yellow ball comes up. If you click that, area that will put a ball there and it'll turn it the color blue. Now that font is not just loaded but it's actually activated to use in InDesign. Okay so I just close Suitcase Fusion. I could drag many a lot, a lot of fonts over here and activate them. <coughs> For now I'm just doing one. So I'm going to close Suitcase Fusion. I'm going to open InDesign. That typeface is called Flood. So now I can grab my type tool I'm going to highlight my U and my T, and up here at the very top is our control panel, and I don't even have to go scrolling through to find it. I can highlight whatever font's in there now, which right now for me is Times, and I can start typing it F-L-O-O, -O. oh, there it is. Don't spend all your guys' time <coughs> scrolling if you know what font you're going to use. Just highlight whatever font's up there and start yeah. typing the name in. Now, oh my gosh, it disappeared. Well, when I click on the black arrow tool, which is called the selection tool, you will see that this box, the container that this is in, has a plus sign. That just tells me that that box is too small to contain that type. I just need to make the box bigger. I'm not holding down shift or command. I'm just clicking and dragging on one of those corner nodes to make the box bigger. That The times font uh, lowercase just didn't take up as much space. 
So that little, if that little box down the lower left-hand corner, or I'm sorry, the right-hand corner, if it has a plus in it, that just means there's more type in there, increase the size of the box. Okay? Again, if I wanted this lowercase, I'd be out of luck because it doesn't come in lowercase. Now let me tell you something while I'm here. You would think that the blood color would be a good color to use because you're like, oh my gosh, this is bloody and they're cutting and stuff. It can be okay. But you have to be careful about what colors you use with black. I don't know if you know this, but using red over black reduces legibility anywhere, anywhere from 40 to 60 percent. Now the bigger the letters, the better off you are, and the brighter the red, the better off you are. But if it were small type, I could not get away with this. That type's small. So you guys have to be careful about certain combinations. If I were to make this, this darker blue, you'll definitely see that that reduces contrast quite a bit. The blue and the black are closer in value. When colors are close in value to one another, meaning if I took a photograph of it with a black and white camera, like a, it was a black and white photo, the value range is too close, <coughs> and it reduces readability or legibility. So you guys have to be really careful about that. <coughs> So I might make that some crazy color like the green. Why green? It goes with the green band-aids. Or I might make it, uh, what other color do we have? Purple. Purple. Now that might be too close to the Or a really light blue, that light blue is in there. Or I could do, or I could do a skin tone, like the pig skin color. So I might, I might look here and try to find something that resonates well with what's going on here. <coughs> Okay. Now, when I'm finished with this one, what I will do is I'll create another page and I'll get onto it with my second one. So I go to the pages panel, which is found over here. By the way, if you lose all your panels, let's say I closed my pages panel. Let's say I ripped it out and I closed it and I'm like, I don't have a pages panel anymore. Where'd it go? Any panel is found under window. So I go to window, pages, it'll pop that back up. I can park it over here. Okay, so pages. Now, I'm going to add a couple of pages in here. There's a few different ways to do this, uh, but I'll just right-click. Now, if your right-click doesn't uh, work, do Control-click. But right-click and insert pages, and I can just tell it to insert two pages after this one. And I have now a page one, two, and three in my Pages panel. Now, you can't see them in the document, but if you hit Command-minus several times, you'll see, oh, look, there they are. Uh, that looks like that. Only there's no page numbers on here because we didn't specify page numbers. Yes, sir? Um, could we add the letters like in Photoshop instead of InDesign? I prefer you go ahead and do them in InDesign because I need you guys to start working in InDesign. Okay. Yeah. Method to my madness is you guys need to learn a bit about InDesign, and most of you already know Photoshop like the back of your hand. Yes? Is that what it says in the project assignment? I can't remember. Well, I can't remember either. I know. I, I might have broken a rule. Is that official? Yeah, I don't know. The question was, am I doing wrong by using a decorative <coughs> font here? Am I supposed to use serif or sans serif? I'm going to reference, usually the answer is yes, but this is a new assignment, so I might have not written it in there. So let's see. Each solution should be on its own board. Photograph the four designs. Clean up any issues with the photo. Okay, step seven. In InDesign, create eight, eight, eight inch by eight inch document. Place the letter and add the rest of the word using typography that complements each letter. You may have to load fonts. Add three more pages, or add, well, it's technically two more pages. Add two more pages and repeat. Each design may have a different typeface used. Nope, it does not say that you have to use serif or sans serif. Yes, you could, as long as it doesn't, yeah, yeah, you could. Yep. I did not write in there that you had to choose from any of the five historic classifications or anything like that. Sometimes they were real stickler about that, but this time not so. You can use whatever you want as long as it resonates well. Makes sense and goes well with the overall spirit and essence of the thing. Okay. Another question. Uh -huh. 
Yes, that's a really good question. You guys at home who have your own fonts and we don't have them here and you want to come here and keep working, here's what you do. You guys ready for And you should do this anyway. Just because it helps you organize all your files. Remember how I told you we placed the graphic and the graphic, the image, and the image still has to come with us and be with that file? So here's what you do. You guys definitely need this. And we will be doing this on every project in InDesign. Just for good measure, <coughs> always package your files. So we would go, now I, I can package it now and I can package it anytime I want. Just make sure it's saved before you package it. So I need to file, save as, and I'm going to call this cut. Oops, I can't spell. There we go. So save the file before you do this, because it, otherwise it'll tell you you can't do it because it's saved, not saved. So we're going to go to file and we're going to go to package. This is four items up from the bottom in that file menu. Packaging is like the gift from the gods. Before we had packaging, we had to be super uber organized and we had to package everything ourselves and make sure everything was in the right folder, kind of like a root folder. Um, now, as long as it can connect to everything, it can connect to the image, it can connect to the font, all those things are loaded, it can package. So we go to file and package. And this window will come up. Now, if we forgot to convert something to CMYK, I know on Monday I mentioned this. I said InDesign will tell you if you have not converted something to CMYK. Where it will tell you, it'll tell you quietly. It'll have a little, um, well, not so quietly. It'll have a little a triangle with a, an explanation point somewhere around here. And then it'll tell you that, hey, your image uses RGB color space. If you see a triangle with an explanation point in it, read this small type and see what the problem is because you've probably done something incorrectly based off industry standards. Will it still package with RGB color space and will it still print? Yes, to both, but it's not right. It's not correct. Now, I have no issues because I have no explanation points. Yay! So I'm going to package this and it will give me this window. This window right now is unimportant to you. This is important when you're an industry person and you're sending something off to a printer and you want it printed for real, a commercial printer. You would put in your contact information, your name, your company, your address, any special instructions, your email, your phone number. That way if they have a problem with your files, they can contact you. So this is something that goes with the, uh, the InDesign file. I, if I cancel this, it will cancel packaging. So I have to hit continue here, and we'll have this little extra file for instructions. Now, it's ready to package, to create the package folder. Make sure you're in the right place. If it's your flash drive, come over here to the far left. Choose your flash drive. Right now I'm working off the desktop. <clears throat> what this is going to do, and you want to make sure this is selected at home too, it's going to copy your fonts. It's going to copy your linked graphics. Your linked graphic is the placed image of your letter. And it'll update any graphic links if we have to have to have them updated. So I didn't have to do anything other than make sure it's on the desktop. And if you don't want to if you don't want the folder called that, then call it something else. I hit package. And then burr, burr, warning, burr, burr, warning. This message says, more or less, you are copying fonts. Fonts are, have special licensing agreements, and they're copyright protected. Do you own the font? Are you okay with copying it? Can you copy it legally? So it, that's basically what it's saying. So I say, okay, yes, I know that fonts are copyright protected. I'm okay with packaging it and using it in this way. It's trying to give you a hey. Now I'm going to minimize InDesign, which is the yellow button. I'm going to click on the finder or desktop. My desktop is very messy. I've been doing a lot today. But this is the folder it just packaged. It's called cut folder. It names it folder. If you can't remember where it is or what it's called, it puts the word folder at the end. My file is called cut. It calls this cut folder. If I open up this folder, you will see that it has, let me view by list, my InDesign document. Well, my document fonts. Flood, STD, Schwell, and my linked graphic, my TIFF. 
just like that. It put everything in one nice place. And I can bring this to school, and I can load that font and continue working, no problem. If you don't package, and you bring your InDesign file only to school, then you're like, oh no, I can't work. Now, how many of you guys have uh, InDesign CS6 or earlier? Okay. You need to do something special, and we need to test this out. Because we haven't tested it since we got Creative Cloud. You need to save backwards, which is really not called saving backwards, but we're calling it saving backwards just for the sake of simplicity. You need to open your InDesign file, preferably the one that's in the package folder. When you open the one from the package folder, it remembers you opened it from there, and what we're about ready to do, it will save back to that package folder. Okay, so I go to File, and I go to Export. And instead of the format being Adobe PDF, I choose InDesign Markup, which uh, the IDML is the, it's going to say cut.idml. That stands for InDesign Markup Language. And so I hit, look, it remembered where I got it from because I opened it from the cut folder. I hit save. And basically, it is an InDesign file. Still writing it. There it is. It says IDML. And it's supposed to be able to open in the most recent previous version. Okay, so you probably could open this in CS6, but I don't know if you can open it in CS5 or 4. We'd have to test it. So you have to remember for uh, you guys who are using uh, older software, like I have older software on my machine still. They don't have CC on my machine. So for me to function here and then go to my machine, I have to export as an IDML file. Otherwise, I'm toast. Okay? Now, Monday of next week, you guys need to bring your package files and stuff like that, assuming you're ready for this. Um, and I will show you how to create a PDF. Some of you guys print here and some of you guys go to Kinko's because you're like, I don't have time to drive to the school and Kinko's is five minutes from me or Staples or Office Max or whatever. They don't have CC, Creative Cloud. They don't have, they've got version CS3 or 4 on InDesign or CS2. They can't open Jack Christmas, let me tell you. They can't do anything. And they certainly don't have your fonts. So they have to have a PDF. So I will also, sh and I require a PDF as well. So I will share with you on Monday how to uh, deal with PDFs, print, and all that stuff. Okay? So there was packaging. Thanks for asking that, Jeffrey. And thank you for letting me know you have an old version of InDesign because this hopefully should work. If not, let me know. We'll have to figure something out. We may have to get you a 30-day trial of InDesign, which is free. And since this is a short semester, that'll work. Okay. So there was InDesign. Um, there's a lot more to InDesign than what I showed you, but that's for what we're doing. This is baby steps. There's InDesign, and then on Monday I'm going to show you more about printing and stuff. Okay? Any questions about InDesign? So far not, but I bet you will later. Okay. I'm going to stop the recording. Save that. Oops. Hopefully it recorded. Uh-oh. Come on. Um, did it not record? See, this happens, guys. Shh, 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 shh.